together. And, and Jordan, I'll turn it over to you to get things going. Thank so, you very thanks much. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate, Appreciate the session. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How you guys doing today? Good. 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 Anybody in uh, in sales at a Fortune 500 company? Publicly traded company? Nobody. Okay, just me. Uh, so never never schedule a presentation. I learned the day after the quarter end. So <laughs> pretty late last night. <laughs> so that's one thing I learned. Uh, we're gonna get started here. Engage. Yeah. So if you've got your phones in front of you, um, keep them out. Uh, don't feel like it's rude at all. Want to engage with uh, the greater community? Use the hashtag Denver Start Den Startup Week. Uh, pivot. Let's use that hashtag to engage the conversation. Jared will be speaking from the back. Uh, if you've got questions you want to make sure we touch on? Please uh, use that hashtag. Uh, super Twitter hand handles are there. And I'm kind of getting used to uh, this pointer for the first time. So very um, We are here today because we want to learn about the options that. All of us have when things aren't going well. Uh, we want to avoid mistakes, or I'm sorry, learn from others' mistakes or their, or their experiences, uh, and increase the chances of getting things right. Uh, my name is Jordan Oliveira. I've been in Denver for two years. I uh, went to college out here, Colorado Christian University. And I think I'm only qualified to speak to you because I've failed. I've, I've not hit my numbers as a salesperson. I've alienated people I've worked with. I've moved too fast for them to catch my train. Let's see what else did I write down on my failures? I have a whole list of them. <laughs> uh, yeah, those are pretty much most of them. But frankly, it's not just the failures, it's because I chose to learn from some of those failures that I think that I might be a little bit qualified to talk with you, because we've all failed at certain times. We have the choice to learn from those, or the choice to just ignore them. Chances are you're probably thinking to yourself, well, what's my next move? Um, do I keep going along the same path or do I just change directions? If we choose to learn from what we've done in the past, we can create a better future for ourselves. So a bit about you guys. That was a bit about me, but let's talk about, about you for a minute. We're all human, which means we all have a, a, a somewhat of a terrifying fear of, of failing or, or dying, right? We want to survive, and that's an important element. I want to welcome my, my bride, my wife, Valeria, who's joined us here. Hey, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> Some of us are entrepreneurs. I'll raise your hand if you are an entrepreneur today. Chase hands. Okay, good. Anybody a want entrepreneur? Not yet there, but you're here because you want to be. That's me. Okay. Um, which means you guys assume more risk than the average person. Uh, this is the maker's track, so let me get a, a show of hands. How many of you are in a maker's uh, kind of operation today? So Scott, a few others, about, about 30, good. Um, and then ambitious, you have the desire to succeed, and you're productive, you don't want to waste time. So if those are things that we all have in common, uh, I think we can all move forward now. There are four decisions that everyone faces. Whether you like it or not, you have the option to continue in one path, you have the option to adjust that path. Realistically, you also have the option to do nothing or do the wrong thing. I think that the, the Eric Reese, who we'll get to in a minute, um, captures the persevere option very well here. He says, well, first of all, pivots. Successful pivots put us on the path toward growing sustainable businesses. Now, on the persevere side, there is no bigger destroyer of creative potential than the misguided decision to persevere. See, everyone faces these, these two options. Um, they, could, they could quit as, as, as one as well. I'm not gonna speak to that. I'm not gonna speak to doing nothing or to doing the wrong thing. I'm hoping to prevent you from doing the wrong thing. Um, who's familiar with this book by Eric Ries, The Lean Startup? Most of you are. Fantastic, chapter eight uh, in there called Pivot or Persevere. A lot of the content we're bringing today is based on that, say about half of it. Uh, show of hands, not just who's read it, this is the harder question. How many of you have implemented the principles? Holy smoke. So Scott's doing it. One, two, fantastic, three or four. This is a little bit harder to implement. I mean, we read books all the time, but actually doing what they say is a little harder. Hopefully we help you today with that. Um, the objectives I have for today is to help you think about failure in a healthy way. We'll, we'll talk about that for about 10 minutes. We'll look at a real-world example with Scott 
Goldie from Yushu will come up here, we'll have a little case study where you guys get to uh, sit in the chair and analyze a real life example that happened this past summer. And then uh, we'll help you learn when to make a decision and then understand your options and how to make that decision and all the different options that are out there. Um, before I get started, I want to give you guys a chance to uh, tell me what you really want to hear or want me to focus on so I can adjust how fast or slow I go on things. Anybody want to share? Yes, please, go ahead. I'm at a pivot point right now. I've gone through accelerators and done a few things and, and of what they've said. I've tried to implement this as much as possible. Um, I am a maker, so I'm really tied to that business. And I do feel pulling toward another thing. But I've spent money on this, you know, tech fashion business. I've invested personal time. So I'm really stuck on, really, how do you decide that? You know, I know it's a personal thing. I heard, you know, a few people say that. But besides it being a personal thing, how do I take the personal out of it and make a conscious decision, honestly? What are you making? What are you making? Um, it's Apron Builder. It's an online apron designer. You design your own apron online. It gets turned into a textile kit that you create. So how are you desire at the end? It's been out in almost a year and wow. not doing great. <laughs> how many How many years? It's one just year. one year. It's just my first year out. Um, part of it, I think, is that it's just not its not what I envision it to be because I'm a bootstrapper. I don't have the capital yeah. um, to make it what I want, so okay. I don't know what to do. Okay. Good. So that's why I'm here. Fantastic. Thank you. I was hoping that awesome. people like you would show up to this. <laughs> awesome. so I'm, I'm here. Like you. <laughs> What's your name? Trexy. 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 T-R-I-X-I. Great, so we'll, we'll try to blaze through things for about 40 minutes or so, get to a Q&A session. And fa frankly, this is a, a, a topic I hope to facilitate, right? I don't have all the answers. A lot of you have answers that could help Trixie. So um, this will be a discussion in about a, a half an hour. <coughs> so the basics, we'll cover three areas. Uh, my name is Jordan Oliveira. I've been in Denver for two years. I uh, went to college out here, Potter Christian University. And I think I'm only qualified to speak to you because I've failed. I've I've not hit my numbers as a salesperson. I've alienated people I've worked with. I've moved too fast for them to catch my train. Let's see what else did I write down of my failures? I have a whole list of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, those are pretty much most of them. But frankly, it's not just the failures. It's because I chose to learn from some of those failures that I think that I might be a little bit qualified to talk with you because we've all failed at certain times. We have the choice to learn from those or the choice to just ignore them. Chances are you're probably thinking to yourself, well, what's my next move? Um, do I keep going along the same path or do I just change directions? If we choose to learn from what we've done in the past, we can create a better future for ourselves. So a bit about you guys. That was a bit about me, but let's talk about, about you for a minute. We're all human, which means we all have a, a, a somewhat of a terrifying fear of, of failing or, or dying, right? We want to survive, and that's an important element. I want to welcome my, my bride, my wife, Valeria, who's joined us here. Hey, babe. Yeah. <laughs> Some of us are entrepreneurs. I'll raise your hand if you are an entrepreneur today. Real quick, fix, chase, hands. Okay, good. Anybody a want entrepreneur? Not yet there, but you're here because you want to be. That's me. Okay. Um, which means you guys assume more risk than the average person. Uh, this is the maker's track, so let me get a, a show of hands. How many of you are in a maker's uh, kind of operation today? So Scott, a few others, about, about 30, good. Um, and then ambitious, you have the desire to succeed, and you're productive, you don't want to waste time. So if those are things that we all have in common, uh, I think we can all move forward now. There are four decisions that everyone faces. Whether you like it or not, you have the option to continue in one path, you have the option to adjust that path. Realistically, you also have the option to do nothing or do the wrong thing. I think that the, the Eric Reese, who we'll get to in a minute, um, captures the persevere option very well here. He says, well, first of all, pivots. Successful pivots put us on the path toward growing sustainable businesses. Now, on the persevere side, uh, there is no bigger destroyer of creative potential than the misguided decision to persevere. See, everyone faces these, these two options. Um, they, could, they could quit as, as, as one as well. I'm not gonna speak to that. I'm not gonna speak to doing nothing. 
or they're doing the wrong thing. I'm hoping to prevent you from doing the wrong thing. Um, who's familiar with this book by Eric Ries, The Lean Startup? Most of you are. Fantastic. Chapter 8 uh, in there called Pivot or Persevere. A lot of the content we're bringing today is based on that, say about half of it. Uh, show of hands, not just who's read it. This is the harder question. How many of you have implemented the principles? Holy smoke. So Scott's doing it. One, two, fantastic, three or four. This is a little bit harder to implement. I mean, we read books all the time, but actually doing what they say is a little harder. Hopefully we help you today with that. Um, the objectives I have for today is to help you think about failure in a healthy way. We'll, we'll talk about that for about 10 minutes. We'll look at a real world example with Scott Goldie from Yushu. We'll come up here, we'll have a little case study where you guys get to uh, sit in the chair and analyze a real life example that happened this past summer. And then uh, we'll help you learn when to make a decision and then understand your options and how to make that decision and all the different options that are out there. Um, before I get started, I want to give you guys a chance to uh, tell me what you really want to hear or want me to focus on so I can adjust how fast or slow I go on things. Anybody want to share? Yes, please, go ahead. I'm at a pivot point right now. I've gone through accelerators and done a few things in, in, of what they've said. I've tried to implement this as much as possible. Um, I am a maker, so I'm really tied to that business. And I do feel pulling toward another thing. But I've spent money on this, you know, tech fashion business. I've invested personal time. So I'm really stuck on, really, how do you decide that? You know, I know it's a personal thing. I heard, you know, a few people say that. But besides it being a personal thing, how do I take the personal out of it and make a conscious decision, honestly? What are you making? What are you making? Um, it's Apron Builder. It's an online apron designer. You design your own apron online. It gets turned into a textile kit that you create. So how are you desire at the end? It's been out in almost a year and wow. not doing great. <laughs> how many? How many years? It's one just year. one year. It's just my first year out. Um, part of it, I think, is that it's just not its not what I envision it to be because I'm a bootstrapper. I don't have the capital yeah. um, to make it what I want, so okay. I don't know what to do. Okay. Good. So that's why I'm here. Fantastic. Thank you. I was hoping that people like you would show up to this. <laughs> awesome. so I've I'm here. Like What's your name? Trexy. 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 T-R-I-X-I-T. Great, so we'll, we'll try to blaze through things for about 40 minutes or so, get to a Q&A session. And frankly, this is a, a, a topic I hope to facilitate, right? I don't have all the answers. A lot of you have answers that could help Trixie. So um, this will be a discussion in about uh, a half an hour. <coughs> so the basics, we'll cover now failure. We'll build a foundation and then give you a framework. Get over it, it's life, failure. Right? It's just part of it. And I think you wouldn't be an entrepreneur today if, if you didn't already confront failure. But I think it's something that we want to address. It's an elephant in the room, in my opinion. Um, we, we love resumes because they have this list of bullets of every success we've ever had. Even if it was a failure, a lot of people just massage it into a success. I see some smiles out there. <laughs> um, but failure in this context is not about... Um, about personal failure. It's a failure as it relates to strategy. There are no failures, as Dan Martle says, there's just experiments that lasted a little bit too long. <laughs> Successful entrepreneurs adapt due to foresight, ability, and tools. Think of the unsuccessful entrepreneurs in your life, maybe your network, they probably didn't have a good foresight, didn't have a foundation, or didn't have the tools or the, or the counsel or advisors to tell them what they needed to think and do because they're emotionally invested. So I tried to think about uh, this topic uh, with three A's. I was thinking about, okay, how can Alcoholics Anonymous, how do you confront <laughs> this thing? Okay, maybe this will work. So acknowledge the failure is real, accept it for what it is, and then make a decision to act. Um, accept the benefits. So on the right side, of the left side of the screen, I put up some things that you could assume at the other end of the rainbow. Yes, there's risk involved, but with most riskful things, there's a huge reward also. Uh, you can't make progress without taking some risk. So consider the progress that you make in life, in your business, just by taking some risk. Now, <laughs> as he joined us. Hey, now we can get started. I was nervous, now I'm not. <laughs> 
and then it's a life too. So error is an inevitable part of life. That's why pencils have erasers. I thought that was a cool, cool quote. And why don't pens? Um, how do you how do you accept it? I think uh, one one thing I can identify with is I'm I'm kind of a perfectionist, and and this this quote here spoke to me. Basically, I have exaggerated expectations sometimes, um, but no matter what what I've done, I'm I'm not excluded from worth and dignity. So I think it's important to give yourself some 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 margin to to make errors, to not have things perfect. And frankly, for this presentation, it wasn't, it wasn't, it's not perfect, but I had to like deal with that. It's not perfect, and you guys are going to love it anyways, right? <laughs> uh, next thing is get perspective. Um, what's the worst that could happen? Uh, you could die, maybe. Um, if that's a, a realistic uh, outcome, uh, I'd say get comfortable with where you're going to spend eternity. Um, but that's likely not going to happen. So think really about the, the outcomes that are out there and, and have some friends around you to encourage you because you will be discouraged. You probably aren't going to go jump off that cliff for the first time to do a base jump without some kind of instructor nearby that's coaching you through it and eventually just kind of knocks you in the butt and you go off the cliff and you have a great time. Um, you can all think of sports or situations where you've been in where that was the case. Somebody older and more experienced was dispassionate, was not emotionally invested and they were able to nudge us along. Act. Um, so act is, is easy enough. The, the problem is we don't make very rational decisions when we have these cognitive biases. Uh, the first ones, when you're familiar with you play poker occasionally, uh, you know when you're putting a ton of money into the pot, uh, you start to think your chances change. <laughs> uh, if you're playing the slots, the more you play, you know, or you flip flipping a coin, every time you flip a coin, the odds didn't change, no matter if you got heads eight times in a row, on that ninth flip, the odds still are 50-50, right? Uh, but a lot of times we, we don't, we don't want to make the right decision, the rational decision, because of all that we've invested in previously. We think we're due. We think we're due yeah. luck. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other one is, let's see, confirmation by some endowment effect. So I'm glad Dan's in the room with us today. Dan, my friend, uh, Dan Pellegrino, uh, Keystone Business Advisors, he sells businesses for a living. And he told me this, he said a third of business owners would rather let their business die than sell it for less than they think it's worth. I uh, Say that again? A third of business owners today would rather see their business decline and eventually just erode and disappear than to sell it for less than it's worth. So they have an overinflated value of what they own and they built, and so it's very hard for them to take something less. Um, and that's part of the endowment effect. I, I'm owed this value, but realistically, you may not be. So that's a cognitive bias that often doesn't help us make the right decision. The other one is um, launch it and see what happens. So just, just confirmation bias. I, I want to be conf I want to have confirmation that I made the right decision in the past. So I'm not going to be specific about what I want in the future. So if you set the goal, see what happens, what will you get? You'll, you'll see what happens. <laughs> and and that's, not, that's not helpful, frankly. Um, finally, post-purchase rationalization. This, this alludes us to think that it'll get better if I just change this one thing. You could be succeeding moderately, but not to your potential. And that's often something that prevents people from wanting to take a step into a risky position because they don't want to have to go tell their networks, go tell their families, shoot, I, I messed up. And, and um, they don't want to take the risk in doing anything worse. And well, Scott will talk to this. There's a huge emotional, psychological side to this conversation. I want to make sure we start with that as a foundation uh, and we build upon it. So, and repeat, I'll repeat. Acknowledge fear, acknowledge failure, accept it, and, and take action. Don't let these cognitive biases distract you. Set the foundation. So the scientific method everyone's familiar with, um, you've seen it in seventh grade, eighth grade, uh, not a whole lot different than the lean startup method, uh, where we have an idea, you test a hypothesis uh, through experiments, you come to a decision point, that's what we'll talk about here, and, uh, and move on. But it all starts with uh, a leap of faith assumptions that cry out for rigorous testing. So, 
if you're a lawyer, you know that your strength of your argument is based upon evidence and assumptions. When you have no evidence, you have huge assumptions, no one believes you, right? But if you can bolster up that evidence and minimize those assumptions, your argument is pretty strong. In this case, we want you to develop an assumption, and uh, in, this, in this case, so we're going to talk about assumptions, things that we want to go test, and then our evidence is based upon a minimum viable product, an MVP. Two types of hypotheses, a value hypothesis. In the case of Yushu, um, do they know about what Yushu does yet, Scott? Yeah. We make flip-flops, but I'll get into it. Perfect, so they make flip-flops, custom flip-flops. So their value hypothesis is, do people care enough about comfort in footwear, specifically flip-flops? Is there value to, get, to, to generate here? <clears throat> and then the growth hypothesis, two different hypotheses, is do people want to buy comfortable flip-flops on demand? What proportion of customers would prefer to have their product shipped rather than made on demand? We need to know, is there a market that's substantial enough to justify investment? Once you've identified your hypotheses, set up some accountability. And this is where you have some guidance to help you evaluate the progress that you're making. But there are things that distract us from making progress, called vanity metrics. Um, these vanity metrics, uh, like, I'll, I'll just give examples and talk to them. So 20,000 likes on Facebook. What does that mean to the bottom line? Useful for persuasion, but not always tied to uh, real results. Um, and you should think. Shark Tank, for example. Shark Tank, Shark Tank gave us a call and said we want you to come on the show. So we thought, well, that, that's got to be that's got to mean something. Yeah, we're making yeah. it. That makes me feel good. We're huge. <laughs> that's exactly it. And people yeah. walking by, just taking a look at Scott making flip flops and yeah. standing around watching, uh, it felt good because they were getting attention. But the results are a different story. So we don't want vanity metrics. We want our good, actionable, accessible metrics. So actionable means um, there, there's a clear cause and effect. If I invest one dollar into a Facebook ad, not one dollar, okay, uh, ten grand, I could I could receive X number of eyeballs, eyeballs to some level of landing page, uh, landing page to conversion rates. Accessible. Now, everyone, you're ready to take action. This is now we're kind of. Moving forward here with these these four, um, four four things that you all have now. You're ready to take action. You're not just sitting there ready to do nothing. Uh, you're ready to work hard. So I'm not, uh, at, at this point, if you're not working hard, that's a different issue, right? We're just assuming everyone has enough discipline to, to work hard on their business. You've got at least one or two hypotheses, and you have metrics that tell you the truth. So persevere only when, pivot, Talk about what it's not first and then what it is. Uh, Persevere is when you're working hard already. You're already split testing and uh, doing A-B testing. You're, you're validating these hypotheses. Uh, I think an important uh, element here I want to speak to is traditional business managers, your MBAs and the big corporations, they, they scour data and evaluate processes to, to identify assumptions. What's harder for an entrepreneur is because you're, you're developing these assumptions, you're developing these hypotheses, and then you're testing them systematically. You're developing the system as well. So that's what uh, the good guys do. But what is, what is, that's persevere, and I don't think I'll to go into more detail on what it means to persevere, except what I've already covered. <coughs> I'm going to save some questions for later, we can talk to it. But I think the bigger question is, okay, pivot. What is it? Uh, first of all, it's not changing the vision. You change your vision means you're t changing the destination. It's almost like giving up. <clears throat> All we're talking about is like you put in uh, your phone or in Google Maps or Waze uh, on the way home. The home is the destination, but but along the path, Google or Waze may adjust your course due to traffic, due to blocks, due to uh, detours. Uh, a change in product uh, that's not a pivot either. That's optimizing something that already exists. Uh, and we're also looking at so continuous process improvement or, or, or Lean Six Sigma. That's just looking at existing process and trying to achieve the same outcome just more efficiently or more effectively. So faster, better, cheaper. That's that's not a pivot. We're clear on what pivot's not. So what is it? It's really just a, a change in strategy. Think about 
uh, you're going home, you're just changing the strategy and the way you get there. It requires that we keep one foot, like a pivot, and a basketball team um, rooted in reality, where you come from, and you're adjusting uh, the other foot. It's about testing a new hypothesis. Three different areas, and you'll see in the charts that follow very soon, uh, we're testing a hypothesis about the product. Uh, are the flip-flops the, the kind that, that people want to buy? Uh, is the business model attractive enough where we make enough, where Scott makes enough profits and uh, there's enough benefit for the consumer? And finally, is there a way to scale this thing? So we tested, or Scott tested these things throughout the summer. So covering the basics, quick review. Failure is not failure. You have uh, a few steps to go there. Uh, the foundation to build upon is the scientific method, and the book covers this in a lot of detail. And finally, uh, pivots just a special change in strategy. So this is my favorite part, so I'm going to talk less theory and more real life um, context. So Scott, this is a great chance for uh, us to talk and, and hang out and look back at the summer, see yeah. what happens. Cry a little bit. Cry a little <laughs> bit. Revisit some dark moments. Um, stand up. I'll stay over here. Yes. Some water. So Can you tell them about um, yourself a little bit. Yeah, so that's that's a lot of book knowledge that I've come to learn through Jordan as uh, he's kind of become my advisor for the last few months. But if any of you are entrepreneurs, you know this is not just a journey through a book. It's an emotional journey. You've got personal, emotional investment. You're personally tied to it. You identify the business like you identify yourself. You know, my wife and I are invested in it. My parents are invested in it. I've got friends and other family roped into it. It's personal. It's a personal journey. So let me tell you a little bit about our company. Uh, I'm a maker, so CNC is uh, my hobby. The big problem with uh, CNC or any of the tools in the making community like uh, 3D printing, what can you make that once you make it, no one else can make. The tools are out there for everyone, but you, divide, you design that widget, you make it, and it gets knocked off immediately because the next guy next door to you has the same tool. The trick is customization. So we thought, what could we make that has to be customized for every single customer? You can't buy it on Amazon. I came up with this two years ago, started with a Dremel in my garage on a block of foam. I called it Quick Shoe at the time. The idea was, I wear flip-flops all the time. You put your flip-flops on, some of them fit, some of them don't. What if every single pair of flip-flops was made for your foot? We could scan your feet, we could mill a pair of flip-flops out of foam with your footprint in them. It would sound so easy, right? That was two years ago. Here's the first flip-flop we ever made. It's not a ping-pong paddle. <laughs> this is one we made in uh, my garage. And I put it on and I thought, my gosh, it's hideous, but I've got something here. This is super <laughs> comfortable. This took a few days, believe it or not. We quickly progressed <clears throat> within a few weeks to this, which is a lot more refined, still my footprint. Now we got the problem, how do we mass customize this? How do we go from scanning to a product in just minutes? That's the key. And that's where the software came in. We had to go back in time. Looks like we regressed a little bit. This was the first flip-flop we ever made within about 15 minutes of scanning the person's foot. We spent over $100,000 getting software design that would take a scan, convert it into G-code for our CNC machine, and create a flip-flop. This is one year ago, October last year. Pretty rough. All right, we're scrambling. We're trying to get to market and we had to make some assumptions. What were those assumptions? We didn't have big data behind us. Um, sorry, I should be looking at where my slides are, just still getting carried away in my own personal story here. So we scan, we make a pair of flip-flops with a CNC mill, and they fit your foot exactly. Play, go ahead and play the video. If any of you want to see a longer video, there's one on our website, but I won't make you watch the whole thing. So this is our robot. This is our system that makes a pair of flip-flops while you wait. Every pair custom fit exactly to your foot. The straps are adjustable. You can personalize the sole. Uh, 
And you get to watch the process? You get well, to watch the process. Well, so we call it retail yeah. theater. It's yeah. entertainment. Yeah. Right. Uh, it's a fun, interactive experience. You feel a little bit like Iron Man when you get your foot scanned. <laughs> um, and then, of course, you end up with a product that you participated in creating. So uh, there's an emotional involvement for the customer, too. I made this. I put the artwork on the bottom. Uh, seemed like this was going to be a fantastic business. And all we had to do was make them, get out there, and people would buy them, right? These are the assumptions. The assumption was, where do people wear a lot of flip-flops all year? You've got to go somewhere where there's a warm climate. You don't want to sell flip-flops in Colorado. That's a bad idea. So we're going to go somewhere warm. Uh, who are customers? This is really what was in my business model. People with feet. Everybody, right? Everybody wears flip-flops at one point or another. They're all, everybody's going to buy them. Right? I'm a millionaire already in my mind. So we decide we go and explore Phoenix. We go explore sunny San Diego. We settle on San Diego. We're going to go out there for four and a half months. And we, we need to get open. Let's just get out there. Let's beta test our first version and get open. I'm tired of being in the lab. Let's just go make sales. We'd already raised money. We've been through our first round. The, what was preventing us from making more, uh, sorry, from raising additional funds? People didn't know, are, are people going to want these really? That was the question I couldn't answer. Yeah, you could make them. Let me back up a, a bit. This is, some of you might sympathize. Two years ago, I tried to raise money off a of pitch deck. People said, you can't do it. You'll never pull it off. You'll never get the software done. You'll never be able to make a flip-flop for every single person. That just makes us mad, right? So we say, of course I can, I'll show you. So I put my own personal funds in, I accomplish it, I go back to the same investors, all right, you did it. Show me the market. Do people really want them? <laughs> so you're beside yourself. So now what do you have to do? Now you have to get out there and do whatever you can to prove that people want them. We need to prove demand. So we go to sunny San Diego, we open up, and guess what? It's everything we dreamed. It actually was. It was spring break. Our goal was to sell 17 to 20 pairs a day. Our first week, we were selling 15 pairs a day. And we thought, no marketing. We just showed up. Instant success. David Justice was our sixth customer. He thought it was the greatest thing he'd ever seen. Uh, he was going to invest all kinds of money. He and I were going to be buddies. I was sure of it. Um, this went on for two weeks for spring break. We were literally toasting each other, saying, we are going to just be huge. This is amazing, right? As I came to learn, that's called a false summit. <laughs> Spring break ended. And here it is now, April. And instead of saying 15 pairs a day is our starting point, we here's where we started. Got some pretty good sales. It's only going to go up from here, right? <laughs> this is my yeah. first week. <laughs> Unfortunately, spring break ended. And what did we start to see? Weekends. Weekends are doing killer business. Weekdays are eating my lunch. I've got employees out there from Colorado. I've got an engineer I'm putting up in a hotel. It's costing me a fortune, and I'm only making my money on the weekends, and it's getting worse. I'm starting to get weekdays where I sell one to two pair. Things are not going so well. It's panic time, all right? And we start to say, where have I made the wrong assumption? Did I go to the wrong mall? Did I use the wrong colors? Did I go to the wrong state? Did I marry the wrong woman? <laughs> you, you literally lose your mind questioning every assumption you've ever made. And you say, which one do I tweak? Which one do I tweak? I don't know what to do. This is where Jordan comes in because I called my managers. I said, here's what's going back, um, and the investors in our company, here's what's going on. We're stagnating, we're not learning anything new, and we don't seem to be growing. June's coming up, we've got another rent payment. Everyone's giving you disparate information. They're saying, just stick around for the summer, right? Persevere, stick it out. Uh, it's gonna get a lot better, it'll be just like spring break. Maybe, maybe not. What do we know? Weekdays are way better than week weekends are way better than weekdays. That's not going to change, and it's costing us a small fortune to stay out there. 
Uh, go ahead. Did you have one machine at the time, or just like one location? We had one machine. Okay. Yep. Our capacity is about 65 pairs a day. Okay. And we're making 20 on the weekend, and we're making two on a Wednesday. And how much is the robot? Uh, the robot, the entire system is yeah. about $50,000 a day. Okay. So, I'll skip the tail on the shoe. <laughs> uh, at the time we were selling for adults were $47 and kids were 20, 29 so it averaged out about $35. So, oh, go back. There's us. There's me. There's my engineer, Bob. Happy times. We just launched. You had more hair. Yeah. <laughs> we're we're going to kill it. Yeah. Not as many wrinkles back then, all of six months ago. <laughs> Yep. So then, these were our assumptions. This is what happened. We weren't hitting our targets. Uh, we had no shipping capacity. What were we thinking? What did we realize? It wasn't everybody. Not everybody liked our, prod our product. It was tourists, and it was a lot of leisure time. People were looking for something fun to do, which we were actually right on. This was entertainment. It was retail theater. People loved to participate. We didn't make a mistake there. Okay, solid assumption. We proved that. Not everybody liked it. It was mostly tourists. We saw a lot of weekend traffic. But that's not going to save us um, because we're losing money pretty rapidly right now at this point. Uh, and we're con I'm frankly confused. I mean, I, I don't know which way is up. I'm getting depressed. Uh, I'm thinking, all right, let's do a marketing campaign. Let's spend some more money. We obviously aren't trying hard enough. My wife says, let's persevere, let's stick it out through the summer. That's how we think, right? As entrepreneurs, you run into a problem, uh, you can't get your business insured, get back on the phone, find somebody who will insure your business. You meet these problems head on and with brute force of will, you get through problems, right? That's what we all do, so it's just another problem. We need more marketing, we need to spend more money. Mm, time out. So, go ahead to the next one. This is Jordan and I's first meeting. We met through a mutual friend. Uh, I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> Except, a few things struck me. Are you learning anything? No. At that point, we had been open two months. We were not learning anything new. What, the other thing he said was, what are the known knowns? Little Don Rumsfeld here. What are the known knowns? What do you absolutely know? We know people love it. We know it's leisure money. Uh, we know it's entertainment. People love the entertainment, excuse me. People like to spend the money for fun. And we're seeing it mostly on the weekends. And we're spending a lot of money. That was a known no. <laughs> okay, we're losing a lot of money quickly. We decide to pivot. It's going to be June 1st here. We've got to make a quick decision because the festival season is coming up in Colorado. And we're thinking, if you're going to make money on the weekends, let's make it at festivals. Let's not go to work during the week. Uh, and let's get the heck out of Southern California. We're also making some new assumptions. And that just that throws your head all spinning because you're, you have to trust yourself again. You have, to, you have to say, all right, we made some mistakes, but Let's try and let's make some, let's uh, move forward. Do you have any questions? Do you, you want to talk about why you were afraid to make that change? Some of the emotions that were going through his head? Because we walked out of this meeting, I remember we um, got to this this final decision yeah. here, and I could just sense like this, like, like a balloon, you know, get it popped. And he just kind of sulks out of there thinking, gosh, I've got to go back to California. And you kept saying failure. And I really hated that word. Right. <laughs> right there. Right there. Right there. Right there. You know, I'm like, is it the book? I'm like, stop like, ah, using the word like failure. When I was a kid, uh, one of the guys in my neighborhood got admitted to Bud's, uh, the Navy SEALs, and threw a big party. And the entire neighborhood went. We all celebrated. This guy got accepted to Navy SEALs. It was the whole, everyone was so proud, taking pictures. This guy's going to be the Navy SEALs. One week later, he was back home, oh, no. and I was embarrassed for him. The family was embarrassed. Now, of course, we know a little more about the Navy SEALs and uh, how easy it is to wash out. Um, but that's how I felt. I felt. I told everybody, I threw a big party, I told everybody I'm going out there, I'm conquering the world. Of course, I'm telling everybody on Facebook, we just killed it for spring break. 
telling all the investors and saying, it's everything I told you it was going to be. Shark Tank's calling me. We are good to go. And it's going to be huge. Six and a half, seven weeks later, I'm thinking I'm going to come home with my tail between my legs. It's embarrassing. And uh, it's, you know, you say it's not personal, it is personal. You feel like a personal failure. Um, and it's not fun. Yeah. It's not fun. Your kids are making you little, you know, greeting cards with flip flops. Your kids think you love flip flops at this point. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to see another flip flop <laughs> as long as you live. Yeah, um, would you make that same decision alone? Why or why not? No, I was so confused. Like I, I literally needed somebody. Even my managers were a little too close. Um, and by managers, I mean other investors in the LLC. We're a little too close to the situation. I couldn't think straight. And this is where I want to say. Get somebody who's dispassionate and cruel, doesn't <laughs> care about your feelings, and is able to say, look, I don't care what you make, this is just business, okay? And that's really hard, it's still hard. I still try to get the word failure out of there, you know, out of his pitch deck. <laughs> Sorry. Anyways, I, um, that's okay, you can go to the next slide. Yeah, so it's this, fun. This is the, like, I hope this is like a climax now. So what all right. happened? So right? I'm, a, I'm a miserable failure. Um, <laughs> I'm coming home with my tail between my legs. <clears throat> he called me like, I, I, before he packed it up and said, are you sure? Are you sure about this? Oh, to the like, last minute. Oh, yeah. What are we, what am I like, doing? Talk him off the ledge. You know? Yeah, Keep it, moving. Was, it was nuts. So we said, all right, Boom. let's go open up. We didn't change anything except our customer segment. The place. The place. the place. Where yep. where can we go where we have people with time on their hands, money to spend, looking for something fun to do? Our assumption, new assumption, was festivals. We pivoted. We tried something new. We didn't try everything new. We didn't change the vision. We still are doing the exact same thing we were doing at the mall. We literally took the kiosk out of the mall, which was never meant to be mobile, made it mobile, got a trailer, and we we're going to hump it around all summer. As you can see... It worked. It was the same, same product, and it's back in Colorado. I mean, who knew? You didn't have to go to sunny Southern California to sell flip flops. You could sell them right here and go home to your kids at night. No, a couple of data kids. points I want to point yeah. out. So it took 90 minutes for people to get their feet scanned. There was such a long line. There was a four-hour wait to get the unit. Now they sold 70 units in one day. That would have been north of 500 units without any constraints. <coughs> Um, they started paying attention to some metrics now. We had, a, we, had, we had a whole new slew of problems, and that was we couldn't make flip-flops fast enough. So People's Fair had 200,000 people. We sold 70 pair a day. We went to the Brewers Festival up in Fort Collins. It had 20,000 people. We sold 70 pair a day. We had an obvious limit set at 70 pair. It was a happy problem. Um, now we had found our customers, we had a product they liked, we were entertaining them, and it was fun, okay? We're having fun with festivals, I'm home during the week, and then Jordan wants to go and mess with it again. Yeah, like, all right, great. <laughs> you had about three weeks of, 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 so, of, of learning. Yeah. We're selling, we're selling, we're maxing out the machine, we're running out of product, this is great. Like, you're starting to feel rejuvenated, and I said, are you learning anything? Uh, now we have the demand, but no, we're not learning anything new. We found our customers, we got our product. He wants to know what will they pay for it. So well, then, like microeconomics, right? Yeah. Demand, supply. Right. All right, now it's time to check the price of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I remember, Scott, I, I probably uh, mentioned it three weeks in a row. Uh, time to bring the price up, bring the price up. I wouldn't do it. And he wouldn't do it. But finally, I went to, uh, what was it called? Dragon Boat? Mm -hmm. Dragon Boat. Uh, days over at Sloan Lake. And I uh, walked up, grabbed <clears throat> that, that, that whiteboard, went to the back of the booth, took my arm, erased <laughs> the prices, <laughs> increased them 25%. So a lady went around the back and said, hey, what are you doing? I said, well, reason, oh, she's making more money. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're in line. But there, there's like 20 people there watching, and right? Other, and yeah. so what, what's my price going to be? There's literally like 15 people in line, and if we, we were whispering to each other, okay, after the guy, the yellow shirt, the price goes up. Got it. Okay, so I see the price. Why didn't I want to do that? So this, this is just a yeah. micro example of why, yeah. why did I want to do that? Because I'm emotionally invested in getting people to buy. I'm selling. I just got crushed 
right? And I'm, I want to. I just want to sell. I don't care if I'm making money. I just want people to want them. I want people to like me. You know, I'm personally connected to my flip flops, and I'm viewing every sale as affirmation of me. Right? He wants to actually learn something and get some business knowledge out of this. So we did it. Um, I'm going to speed through here because I know we got some actual more good content at the end. Um, Satisfaction? Yeah, so we raised the prices. Demand did not go down for about three time, three festivals in a row. We kept raising, raising, raising prices. We were still making 70 pairs. However, what we did see was an uptick in some negative feedback. Right. So we had raised prices past the point where people people began to have higher expectations of the product that we were delivering. So we would get very polite emails, occasional nasty ones, but some that would say, you know, I just didn't feel it was worth $55, you know. I, I got it, uh, really comfortable, feel like you're onto something, but not $55 stuff, which I knew. I was not claiming it was $55 at this point. We were experimenting, so we started to bring it back down, but we were learning. We learned, all right, it's not $55. It's also not $35. There's a happy point in there. So we were, we were learning. How so about go ahead. shipping? How about that real quick? So, oh yeah, so the throughput, that was just a solution. We started, we tested the shipping model. This went back to the entertainment. We made an assumption that nobody wants these unless they can be entertained and participate, right? That was just, I knew that to be true. Nobody wants to get these shipped to them. Except we weren't learning anything new, so let's try to ship them. At first, we charged $5 for, at first we did free shipping, and we had half our customers, we made another 70 pair a day that we made during the week, and we were just scanning feet, and people were like, sure, ship them to me. Okay, that was pretty cool. Then, we charged $5 for shipping. Eh, I kind of saw a little bit diminishing. Then, we flipped it. We went totally counterintuitive and we gave you a $5 discount to ship because it only took us a few seconds to scan your foot, whereas it takes us 10 minutes to make a pair of flip-flops. We can make them all week long. Let's just get you in the system and get them scanned. That worked too. We got up to about 140 pairs a day. We're cranking on this. Um, I'll get to the long story short. Go ahead to the next slide. Yeah. There's some of our product. Every single one of these is somebody's unique footprint. Um, each pair of flip-flops is something they designed, fit to their foot. Uh, this is a shipment from, this is a picture I took after one festival. These were the shipping pairs we had to make during the week. And um, the 1,000th pair was inside. Yeah, the 1,000th pair, that was somewhere mid-summer. Um, so now what? Sure. Well, yeah, we, sold, we sold out of material. Hopefully so, you're selling it as a business op and just taking royalties now. So this was the other thing that happened at the festival. Thank goodness we pivoted because there are professional festival goers, uh, retailers. I don't know what you would call them. Carnies. Carnies. <laughs> the carnies. And, and that's right. Every single one of them, every single festival, there was one or two that came up and said, where can I get your system? We're going to Florida. We're going to Spring Break down in Arizona. Um, this could be a vanity metric. It would just be, hey, really cool product. It would kill down in Florida. Or it's something we need to explore. Maybe we're actually not a flip-flop company. Maybe we're a tech company. Maybe all we do is create the system that designs the flip-flops. It flipped our model on its head where we're not going to go out there and expend capital and manage employees. Let's build systems and we'll sell the systems and support the systems for other people to go out there and make these for us. So that's where we are right now. Um, we are, let's see, anything on here I need to cover? I think we've covered a lot of it. I think, yeah. The, the, yeah. I'll go into it. Yeah. So anyways, that's where we're pivoting. Uh, we could be pivoting again to developing these systems, selling the entire system. Uh, and providing lifestyle businesses to other carnies while maintaining re <laughs> recurring revenue stream for us and supporting their business by selling them materials, software updates, new design. Um, really kind of re-envisioning ourselves as a, as a software company and a tech company. Um, Have you got the cost of your machine, you know, your whole system down now? Yes, the cost yes, of course, yeah. and materials yeah. and so forth. Yeah. So we're back to, we're back to raising money again and, uh, but it was 
six months, and it felt like six years, but it was it was crazy. So I'd be surprised. Fantastic job. Good job. job. So that's Scott's story. We're going to apply some of the things that you learned from Scott into now when to pivot and how to pivot. I want to make a few comments there. Uh, first of all, <coughs> Scott took away some of the things that venture capitalists look for. They look for market risk and technical risk. Technical risk still exists, but now market risk is reduced because he's gone out there and tested different markets. He can say confidently, hey, if we go plop this on the strip in Las Vegas, it's likely going to go gangbusters. Right? But he couldn't say that earlier. He couldn't say the price is substantially you know, reasonable at $45 because he hadn't tested it yet. He didn't test the shipping model until he had me kick him in the butt to go get it done. And, and he did it. And I'm, I'm just so proud to have a friend like Scott uh, that's willing to adjust his bottle and let me tinker with it a little bit here and there. Um, fantastic story. Uh, you heard about the minimum viable product in there. You heard about hypothesis testing. So we looked at the metrics that mattered. Uh, we, we learned it just enough until right here. The effectiveness of the experiments started to get reduced. So learned a lot in the first week, spring break hit. After spring break, we saw the drop during the week. Weekends picked up again. You don't need to spend a year doing that to recognize what was happening. So that's when you uh, look for that assumption, uh, restate it, and, uh, and pivot. But beware of this symptom in disguise. Sometimes people will say, uh, pivot when you're not passionate anymore. I would say, I don't agree with that. I think that we all get discouraged at different, different times. We can't constantly be passionate about something. It's just not realistic. So I'd say, go find a friend of, you, a friend of yours that uh, was involved in your life, that knew you before you became passionate about this concept, and have them sort through whether or not this is a temporary um, detour or, or it's something more permanent that you need to just go ahead and just shut down. Uh, about runways. So the word burn rate is used in the book. You're probably familiar with it. Uh, but really, your, your runway for your startup is as long as the number of pivots you have left. So about the runways, um, the traditional approach is, let's say you start off with 12 grand in the bank and your burn rate's four grand, you've got about three months until you're done. Something has to change by then. But if you're using this methodology, uh, you don't have to burn four grand after that first month because you're, you're testing the hypotheses. Maybe your cash flow starts to improve. Now you only burn three grand, and then two grand, maybe one grand. Just enough to learn enough, reduce that market risk, talk to enough investors, and, and skyrocket. Um, we'll talk about some examples, some things to avoid doing, and make things to do to make sure you do it well. The book talks to 10 different types of pivots. I'll briefly go over them. We're going to focus on four of them. Uh, the zoom in. This means you have four different types of features. You're going to only focus on one feature that the customers love. The customer segment pivot. You saw that with Scott today. The customer need pivot. What's the pain point they have? The platform. Maybe you're moving from an Android or your Google Play platform to a Apple Store platform. Uh, the business architecture. How you're designing uh, the business model. Uh, how you're capturing the value from the benefits that the customer receives, to the price you charge, to the cost to deliver, to the gross margin, um, all those things were something that we discussed a lot on value capture. Engine of growth, how are you going to scale this thing now? Can you realistically uh, scale a, a mobile kiosk that's, that's going on and going to different festivals? We don't know yet, but that's a question that we have to ask ourselves. Uh, finally, the channel that you're going to go out to go acquire sales. Uh, and then finally, the technology. Let's first start with, you should, you're already familiar with this. Um, we started in the malls, went to the festivals. The only thing changed here is we knew there were customers out there. We just didn't have the right ones. So it was a partially validated hypothesis. Yes, customers liked it, but not the right ones were engaging with us constantly. Finally, on the channel side. So we knew that people liked it on demand, but over time, we talked to enough customers, and because of the constraints, we couldn't satisfy 200 different units in one day. We just didn't have the throughput for it. We offered the shipping option. And we learned more and more, people didn't really care a whole lot about on-demand delivery. Some of them were okay with just scan my foot and ship it to me a few days later. And that developed a new, a new channel for us. The zoom and pivot. 
Uh, one example is the disk agent had four different uh, features. A lot of customers liked the remote swipe, the remote wipe. Uh, that was what most customers used. They rebranded themselves, called themselves Drive Strike, and took off. A uh, customer need. Uh, you might be familiar with uh, this company. I'm not going to mention it just yet. Uh, but they noticed that customers wanted a toilet paper um, roll uh, that was waterproof to go camping. So they developed a, a canister for that toilet paper. Um, ended up pivoting a little bit, and see if you can guess uh, who I'm talking about here, to GPS units. From GPS units to Palm Pilots, late 90s, early 2000s. Autobots. So they found other problems that could be solved by their team. So those are the 10 pivots. i um, love to talk to those in more detail. Uh, but I think Seth Godin, a guy I really like uh, to follow, um, he hits a pretty, pretty, pretty cool in this way. Um, he says, keep your machines, but, but change what they make. Keep your customers, but, but change what you sell them. Um, I'll let you guys read those things. I'll read them off the slide for you. But there's, there's two different, if you want to take pictures of this, there's two different uh, tables. The other one is, uh, keep your mission, but change your scale. Keep your products, but change the way you market them. Um, so I hope that this could be just sort of a, a cue to help you think about different ways um, to change your strategy. Things to avoid are um, energy and public relations. So the more you hype things up, like in the case with, with uh, Scott, he told all of his friends about it, and that's, that's not a bad problem. Tell your friends, tell your family, the more you announce a huge opening, uh, the more difficult it is emotionally to let go of Escondido, in Scott's case. Uh, so just be careful of that. For yourself, to make the decision without public embarrassment or distraction. That's especially hard if you're raising money, because you've got to put on, you've got to be realistic, but you've also got to put on your best, you put on a little bit of a front, yeah. and say things are going really well. Um, PG bar. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. The other one is to continue without an advisor um, who is not emotionally invested. That's something to avoid. So I'd say find a board of advisors or find an advisor at a minimum that's not emotionally engaged. Um, that'll help you not go alone. Uh, finally, complacency is something that you often see. People don't think they're in a turnaround often. But I've heard uh, Kevin Miller speak on this topic, Colorado Christian University. He said, uh, we're, you're always in a turnaround. Your foundation is constantly being eroded every day. It's an ongoing process. Uh, it's not just a point in time. So avoid complacency. What to do? Last thing you want to do is make a big decision when life's intense, emotions are high. So schedule it. Assume it's going to happen. Eric Reese says two to eight weeks. So this is just these are just some guidelines. It's not, it's not a rule book here. But schedule that recurring meeting about a month at a time. Uh, have people from product development there, have business leadership there, and have an outside advisor show up as well. They help see past preconceptions and interpret the data in new ways. In this meeting, uh, you want to begin with the end in mind. So say, uh, say we're, we're, we're in California, and we want to test the assumptions that we're going to hit 20. What kind of evidence do I need, 20 per day, what kind of evidence do I need to validate that that success metric. Well, I need to go out there and just sell um, in a variety of different ways. But make sure you, you go ahead and set a marker out there, set that metric up in this meeting, and then work backwards. OK, if I want that to be successful, what metrics do I need to have to prove at the meeting that I have like next month to prove that, hey, guys, we were successful. These metrics show that we validated our hypothesis. Um, two principal strategic questions every business strategy guy uh, tries to ask um, are, are around uh, this. And I'll use Yushu as the example here. What does Yushu possess? What advantages do they have that would translate into profits, a value statement? And finally, what business environment permits Yushu to, um, to take these advantages and turn them into profits. So 
I've heard two questions. I can restate them real quick. Then a little confusing there. Um, what does Yushu possess as an advantages to translate the profit into profits? And then finally, what's the environment that best allows this model to translate into profits? So one's around value, one's around the go-to-market strategy. Another one, uh, I'm a Lean Six Sigma black belt, and what we do to improve processes is ask a series of why questions. Sometimes they call them five whys. I don't think you have to go that far. But in the case with uh, Yushu, I'll use a couple of examples. So I might have asked um, Scott in that meeting on, on May 9th. So, so Scott, why are revenues 30% of expectations? Why are people watching but not buying? That told us more about the customers that were actually buying. Customers that weren't buying were those that were there with a destination in mind. They didn't have leisure time to check things out. Why are they in the mall? Why are most buyers buying on the weekend? And, uh, those series of questions allowed us to get to a certain point. And finally, finally, actually, and they, were, <coughs> they were questions that I didn't think to ask, but I actually knew the answers. He knew the answers. To them. Yeah. But because I was emotionally involved, I was asking these somewhat difficult questions because the answers were hard to face. Yeah. Finally, uh, find a flexible model. I think we stumbled upon this, the, the festivals, because you could try it, try this demographic, the rodeo fair, wasn't a great one, and, and, and learn more about his customer segments. So if you could find a festival-like model for your business where you are allowed to adapt and adjust on the fly, I think that's um, a wise thing to consider. Yeah, I mean, signing, signing a four-month lease yeah. with the mall, you're locked into this business strategy. It's hard to operate the business. You yeah. have no downtime to make any changes. You're committed to one model. So if there's anything you can do that just gives you that flexibility, yeah. you know, I would go that route. Great point. Great point. So uh, call to action. We're going to wrap up here, guys. There's, there's uh, drinks in the fridge and snacks. Uh, about five more minutes and we'll be all done here. So the point of today's session was to help uh, help you follow principles that are resilient in the face of mistakes. So even if you take the wrong turn, you have the tools now. You need to realize it and the agility to find another path. The objectives today, um, which aren't on here, are uh, that we acknowledged and accepted and now acted in the face of failure. Uh, we've established a foundation for making the right decision. We looked at Yushu's journey of pivots throughout this past summer. Hopefully it's helped you think of ways you could apply the same story to yours. We talked about when to make a decision, and hopefully you, discuss, you understand some of the options that exist for you. And we covered a lot today. Um, what I promise to do for you is if you go to my website and subscribe, or just give me your email address in some manner, I'll send you a one-page PDF of, of the top ten things to take away from the session today. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Um, I want to say a big thank you to Grayling Denver, uh, to Steve Palmer, uh, to Peter, to, uh, to the, whole, the whole staff here for opening up this venue for us. It's fantastic. If you go around here, uh, you can walk out on this terrace and go and see a, I think a 270 degree view of 16th Street Mall. It's pretty cool. I want to thank uh, Calvary Church for donating the 40 chairs. Uh, I want to thank Calder <laughs> Christian University for the help with the uh, audiovisual. Uh, Dr. Gary Ewan, uh, Sarah Hartland, and uh, Jared back there. Thank you, Jared. I want to thank my family, uh, my, my wife Valeria. I've got two young boys, uh, four and, and two months. Uh, so they've put up with me spending a lot of uh, late nights preparing for this. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, you got that opportunity right there. you got my website. Um, on you, should we want to talk to you real quick? Yeah, so we're uh, speaking, we're one of eight companies uh, pitching at the Colorado Capital Conference in two weeks. Uh, you can check us out, it's in the Denver Post building, I believe. So it's going to be an honor that we were invited to uh, pitch there. And if you have any questions about that, you can follow us on Facebook or go to our, uh, our website. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm just curious why you turned down the Shark Tank. I, I heard some really good reasons yesterday from the angel investors uh, of that board. Yeah. Um, I actually did not to... turn them down. So oh, okay. we were scheduled um, to be on September 11th. Uh, they had scheduled us for a four-day shoot. And then they had a low-level producer call me and say, like a week and a half before, 
sorry, we don't need you this season. No explanation. And, you know, can you tell me any reason why? No, I, I don't have any information. So it, it was devastating because we've kind of been looking forward to it. We thought this would be really fun. I, I'm a fan of the show. Um, I've been told by many of our investors and potential investors that it could be a blessing in disguise. Yeah, that's why I got yeah. yesterday. Yeah. So. So. Yeah, and that's why I was wondering. I didn't ask. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I've moved on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do. they, I did get invited. They Short told tick. me, though, mine yeah. wasn't repeatable and scalable, so at least I knew. Yeah. And that's kind of where I came into what I'm in I would have loved any information. I mean, that was know, at least like, I didn't get anything. It's like a breakup. No. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's really hard. It's really harsh. My mentor at the time said, be thankful. You don't want to yeah. be a part of that yeah. crowd. I was like, okay. Oh, we still have a couple minutes. Should, yeah. Do you want to try to tackle um, together, maybe? Tackle her apron thing? We could do yeah. it in this formal setting, or yeah. I mean, we could hang out in the lobby, grab a beer, and, and then come back in. Too. Yeah, if we grab a beer and come back, because I, you know, it's like I have a six year old daughter, and, uh, you know, it's like perfect for moms and their six year old daughters who all day long on Pinterest yeah. are looking for stuff. And, you know, to me, it's like, You've got a great reference here to do a pivot with a manufacturing product or whatever, but it's sort of like you've been at it for a year. You should have be able to learn a lot of stuff from what you've right. done so far. Right. Keep learning, but you know maybe you're just at a pivot. Like don't give up yet. Right. Why don't we do that? So anybody who needs to go, they can go. Anybody who wants to stick around for another twenty half hour or so, grab a beer, come back in, and, and we'll chat. You know what? I bet Grayling will give you guys markers too. Cool. Oh, yeah. Any other general questions? No, there's a really survey online, too. Good job. Good job. For a survey. Uh, appreciate your feedback. Thank you guys very much. Thank you.